We are in a really special place on the east side of Etna in a town called Bronte, which is world famous for its pistachios. And we just stopped and got some by the side of the road. These are very, this is what they look like in the show. And they have little flecks of red. These are world famous pistachios. They are guarded after their harvest. Only every other year, I think. And then, I thought, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna taste one. It's really delicious. And this is what they look, they've all been harvested from the tree. And that's what they look like when they grow. The branches are growing in lots of different directions. And we have been driving and driving through Bronte and we see groves and groves of pistachios. It's really incredible. By the way, next to it is an olive tree. You can see real, real olives growing here. There's just, Sicily has olives and we've come, I mean, almonds and everything. Pear trees, we drove by peach trees. It's just so lush and so wonderful. And I thought you would like to see something you don't usually get to see. Pistachios from Bronte. We are in Bronte, Sicily. And evidently Bronte is the capital of pistachios in Sicily. It's so amazing because this country has so much to offer in terms of all the different things it grows. But pistachios is the thing in Bronte and they're world famous. In fact, they're, they're harvested here only every other year and they're guarded actually by the Carabinieri, the local police force actually has a helicopter force dedicated to guarding this harvest because it's really, really valuable and lucrative for the town's economy. But we thought we would get some because we, and so I got this little thing, which I'm gonna eat right in front of you and see what's, which is pistachio cake. I love pistachio, so this is like Mecca. That tastes delicious, it's like a, it's like a nut bread. It's more like a breading, but really, really good. And I got potato ice cream, which I already started eating, but so used to because I can't even stop myself. But this is really, really cool. Oh my god, it's amazing! It's creamy, it's subtle, it tastes very natural too. I think these things. I, I wanted you to see this stuff because I think what is really cool about Sicily and characteristic is its love of food, and all of these dishes are. These ingredients are local. They're organic. They're regional to this place. And they, there's a million things that they make with pistachios. And I've never really encountered that anywhere and I don't really do it in home cooking. But I want to try a little bit inspired by Sicily. I think the food is so much a part of the culture and the family and the cooking. And um, pistachios is really at the head of that, especially in Bronte. We are in the town of Monreale. We were just at the incredible cathedral. We're walking around. This town is so charming. It's got tiny little winding streets and beautiful little shops and gorgeous produce stands and it's really neat. But I wanted to show you something special because this is a prickly pear. This is really a Sicilian treat. I don't think it started life here, but it's certainly used on close up to see. So they peeled it for us. I never ate one before. So you get to watch me eat this. So maybe we can experience the coolest thing about this is the color. I don't know if you can see it on the film, but this is my favorite color. My front door is this color. It's hot pink. And uh, they use it in recipes. They eat it on the street. And I was, uh, is this rude? I guess I'm gonna do it anyway. Lots oh of my gum. It tastes like um, something's chewy. That's interesting. Oh, I think there's seeds. I think there's seeds in it. Um, tastes like chicken. No, don't do it. It tastes like, um, it tastes like a little bit, like a really soft apple. Uh, yeah, like a really soft apple, but less sweet, but really succulent. Succulent, that's the word, so see a writer. Mmm, prickly pear, get some. Well, <laughs> that video, that, let me tell you my favorite thing about the video. My favorite thing about the video is that I'm sitting there eating a prickly pear at the end and trying to decide what it tastes like. And you know what it tastes like? A pear. But for some reason, that word does not come to mind. I'm like, this tastes like something, an apple, a banana. It was like, okay, 
Wow. Like, anyway, um, the, the videos are entertaining. I wouldn't say they're highly educational, but then again, I had never seen a prickly pear ever. Now I know that I, you know, well, Laura, she gets out. So she was telling me how that was a cool thing a while ago. Like there were prickly pear martinis and prickly pear, but it was really, really cool to get this stuff. I mean, can you imagine getting a pistachio from a tree and then they, they make the thing right there. It has so much flavor. My mouth is watering. You can't even believe it. So it was really, really cool. And obviously there's so much, we're talking about loyalty. They're supposed to be talking about a book, but all of that great food is in this book. And there's something else that's really important that I wanted to bring out today. <clears throat> I'm not gonna begin with the food. I'm gonna circle back to it. Let me tell you about a place that, where Laura and I stayed. It was our hotel, it was in Palermo. It was called Villa Ijea. It was a very, very old historic hotel. Now this is gonna circle back, believe it or not, to my theme. And this is just like how I spent my research trip. This is what it looks like. It's an amazing place. It is actually a villa right on the water. It was built by the Florio family in 1900s as a sanitarium, because during that time, Sicily was becoming known as a very fashionable spot, like Nice, like the French Riviera. And so they wanted to attract more people. And as I've mentioned in previous videos, very famous writers, Dumas, Edgar Allan Poe, uh, Goethe, people came to Sicily because it was a cool place and they want, it's a beautiful, so you have this beautiful, it looks like a castle, right? Gorgeous gardens, it's called Villa Ijea, right? It's right on the water. You can see the water, you walk right down. This is the view of the morning. This would be like if you got up in your hotel and you walked out. Laura and I stayed there, right? You walk around, there's grounds are beautiful. There's lemons growing. There's lot, you never saw anything like this. But look at this, this is like right on the hotel grounds. Gorgeous, super, super classy, really nice. Here's what it looks like. I wanna tell you why this matters. Here it is at night. Isn't that gorgeous? Just really beautiful. It ends up being because it was built in the turn of the century and became a very historically important hotel because of the Flor Florio family, which I'm gonna to get to in a minute. It became an example of Belle Epoque architecture. It was designed by a guy named Ernesto Basile. And so that's characterized by, you see all that like, woodwork and this special kind of thing, this ballroom that was called the Hall of Mirrors. They used it as a conference center, but I sneaked, I snuck in one night and I took this picture. It's just as it used to be. It's really a gorgeous old grand hotel. Here's this, is this the, uh, yeah, here's the Hall of Mirrors. Like there's the mirror, all real wood. And you see this, um, you know, think of Tiffany lamps, you know, that really, uh, do you see the floral print on the wallpaper? really rich drapery, very, very authentic to period. Here's a better example of the, the wallpaper. This is like house porn, but there's a, there's a reason for this. Here's all the original wood in the stairway. Really, really amazing. Here's me and Laura. Why does this matter? Here is the book I got at the hotel about Villa Ijea because since it's such a historic place, they sell this book. And it became, here's you can see it, what it looked like in the old days, because since Sicily did so much on the water, there was so much sea travel, as you can see in this old picture, this is the 1900s, it privileged sea arrivals by sea, right? There's no cars, you're not, you're, you're pulling up in a boat. And so there you have it. Now, what is interesting about this? Why does all of this matter? The Florio family, the, there were, it started life in the late 1700s with two brothers, Paolo and Ignazio. They lived in Naples, outside of Naples, but there was an earthquake, so they fled Naples and they went to Sicily. They're two very close brothers. They begin a business. Their business is being spice brokers. They sell salt, they sell all kinds of spices, exotic spices from Africa, because if you remember, here we are, Sicily's in the mi middle of the Mediterranean. Remember I said to you, it's not Italian per se, it's his own thing. It's been colonized so many times that it's in these crosswords right in the middle of the ocean. And so it can get tr s s spices and all kinds of things like that. And the Florios begin to sell them. What I wanted to look at is I started to study about the Florios because the Florios eventually become like the Rockefellers of Sicily.
And why that matters is because when I went to look at loyalty, what I started to look at was the rise of the mafia, right? And part of the thing I learned is that part of the reason crime flourished like that and families got into the crime business was because there was no upward mobility. The nobles blocked it and only nobles could own land. It was basically a feudal system. The one exception was the Florios because these two very enterprising brothers who start a spice brokerage in Palermo and start to work their way and up and start buying other types of businesses. And they, they have a son named, named Vincenzo and Vincenzo is very enterprising too. And so they start to do a ship, they buy, start to buy ships because they're, they're growing their business. They go, well, if we're gonna have spices. We wanna put them on ships, why not our own ships? And so they start to grow their family business and they start to become very known. Now, what's the fun fact about this is I'll show you a picture of Vincenzo Florio. He really existed, he is a real person and he looks very cranky in this picture. That is Vincenzo Florio. The fun fact, which I was astonished to learn, is that Vincenzo Florio, and this brings it back to food, invented a food that you probably have in your cupboard, which is tuna in oil. If you have tuna in a can, if you have tuna in oil in a jar, this method of tuna processing was invented for the world by Vincenzo Florio sometime between 1835 and 1849. And here's what happened because they live right in Palermo, right? And so they have a tunery. It's called a tanara. They, they, they fish for tuna and sadly they kill them and then they chop them up and they would, what they would do is take raw tuna and put it in brine or salt to preserve it. But what ha and they want to put it on a ship and send it away, right? They're trying to make money selling fish. The problem was that it wouldn't last. It would start to spoil. You couldn't get it. You could get it to Italy on time, but you probably couldn't get it to Europe. You certainly couldn't get it to America. So one day, Vincenzo Florio is in his kitchen, and the legend is that it's true that he thinks to himself, hmm, why don't we cook the tuna first and put it not in water or brine, but in oil? And he invents this. They all think he's crazy. He says he spends years perfecting it. And God bless the guy. Now they, they start with this method out of Palermo, Sicily. Vincenzo Florio invents this way of processing tuna and all thereon, all kinds of canned fish. And it gets sent all over the world and everybody adopts it. But he was the one who invented it. If you're wondering where, you know, fish of the sea came from and you have it in your cupboard, it's because of him. Now, what does this have to do with loyalty? Of course, she's going to start barking. This is what it has to do with loyalty. When I'm, I have to tell a story, right? I can't tell a story that's nonfiction. I have to story, tell a story of fiction. And I want to tell a story about people that I imagine. I can't tell if the dog's bothering you. Is the dog bothering you? I swear to God, I'm gonna bring you with me. The, the, so basically, what is happening is that I have to create these characters. And I think to myself, part of the way, I'm gonna get this dog. I wanna see if this works. We're gonna take a little risk on our little thing. Here, you can walk outside with me. I don't think I'm gonna lose you, but if I lose you, I'm gonna get you back. I'm gonna let the dog out of the house. Here, you can see, this is the front yard. Go out, Peach, because you will always make noise at exactly the wrong time. Go out and bark like a little freak, because that's what you love. Look at this, sir. I didn't even mess up. All right, yeah, now I can think. Okay. So when I'm writing a novel, I have to make characters, right? And one of the ways, there's lots of ways you can tell somebody about what a character is like inside. But one way I like to do it too, there's a whole bunch of them, but the one way I wanna talk about now is think about who they admire. Who is their hero? Everybody admires somebody, you know, or, and it can be someone you know, Oprah, whatever, anybody. But I thought, what would be points of reference? Because I wanna make characters, well, let's think. I wanna make a family. Now, if you wanna have a family business, which like these guys have, his name Franco Fioravanti, in loyalty, he's fictional. He wants to have a family business. He can't go up and he doesn't really have the business sense of the Florios. He wants to, 
but he's thinking, you know, I really admire those Florios. His heroes are the Florios. He's fictional, but his hero is a real life businessman. That would make sense. That's who he would, because partly when, he, when we talk about term of role model, you know, you always go, what kind of career do you want? I mean, what do you want to, what are you trying to become? You know, I mean, in my own life, I was like, oh, I love reading. I love reading. I want go, oh God, I'm going to try to become an author. Well, gee, who else? Well, when I started out in the 90s, 1990s, John Grisham was huge, still is. And I was like, wow, that's kind of, I, maybe I can kind of do that because I'm a man, I'm a woman lawyer and he's a guy lawyer and I'll write those stories and I'm off and running. What happens in loyalty is Franco Fioravanti and his brother, Roberto, they're two brothers, just like the Florios, Ignazio and Paolo, real life people, fictional people. I did it on purpose. I'm smarter than I look, not much, but I thought to myself, this is interesting because I love the idea of a family business because that was the only way you could get ahead if you were kind of trying to become something in Sicily because of this terrible class structure. So here's Paolo and, and, and um, Ignazia, the Florios, and they're doing a business, but here's my fictional guys and Franco and Roberto, and in a way they foil each other. They're foils for each other because, and you remember that term from your English class, right? Because you start to see how they're different and how they're alike. We both have family businesses. One is a legit family business that sells spice and eventually we'll start getting into shipping and eventually we'll own banks and we'll process tuna and process sulfur and buy silk and do lots of things so that you become the Rockefellers of Sicily. What happens to Franco and Roberto is the story of loyalty. They don't go into legitimate businesses. They take another route. And it isn't the mafia. As we know, it starts life as a family business. It started in Sicily at the exact same time the Florios started. There is a reason. There is two families and they each take vector off in different directions. That's really what I was going for. I really wanted the Fioravantes to admire the Florios. And you would, you have to have a poison reference. Part of when you're writing historical fiction, not only am I trying to characterize somebody for you, but I'm also trying to place it in time, right? He can't like Oprah, Oprah didn't exist yet, imagine. But you, but he can like the Florios and he go, oh God, if we just do this, we can be like the Florios. And his brother Roberto, who's kind of more easygoing from Bronte with pistachios, wants to just pick pistachios, wants to pick lemons, doesn't really have ambitions. He's like, no, just be happy, enjoy yourself. You're too much like mom, she was crazy. And that dichotomy between these two brothers in a way is very, very, it's a little similar to the Florios and it really mirrors them and in a way it foils them. And I think you start to understand each character better in context and in contrast with the other. That's what I think what I was trying to say. And what I wanted to segue into for a moment is it's who are your heroes? Who are your heroes? Uh, it sort of becomes a question of loyalty. What is a hero? What's a good guy? What's a bad guy? Kind of a similar question to what happened to the Bennetts. And it segues into something sort of fun before I get into, go ahead. But because this is the day before tomorrow, which is the publication of my short story for Amazon, Pigeon Tony's Last Stand. It comes out tomorrow and it is free to people who have Amazon Prime. And I think the audiobook is too, but you have to check me on that, but I think it is. The reason I mention that is because it is part of a series. Amazon is doing a series of five stories by all by other authors. They're also, I really think they're, they're terrific. And the series is called, We Could Be Heroes. And I, that's so interesting because in a way I, when they, when Amazon asked me to do this, Amazon Publishing, I was really honored and I thought, they said, we want to do a thing about, you know, making what is, an, what is a hero. And I thought, I think about that every book. So, and I like to think of my characters as heroes. And those of you who have read Rosado, you know Pigeon Tony, he's a hero to me. He's not typical, he's not Superman, he's not Iron Man. It's really a what is a hero in an unconventional way of looking at what, what is a hero. And I think a way that is more real, honestly, we, we don't have superpowers, but we can attain integrity, dignity, tenacity, honesty, and those are the characters that define P 
Pigeon Tony. And uh, I love that about him. So I hope you'll get get a copy of the book. And I also want to say a fun thing that Amazon Publishing sent me today, which is how cool is this? To celebrate the publication tomorrow, look at this. This is a cookie from Amazon Publishing made to look like the cover of the short story. Is that amazing? And they also said, and it's so good. I had one, but I'm not going to eat the other one because you've watched me eat enough things tonight. We Could Be Heroes is the name of the series. And here's the other authors. Let me read my cookie. Lisa Scottolini, me. Lisa Unger, terrific suspense author, domestic thriller author. Love her books. I've loved her books for ages. Janelle Brown, another terrific author. JT Ellison, another terrific author. Also suspense, domestic suspense. And Victor Mathos. So there's some wonderful, wonderful authors there. I hope you download. I think they're all available tomorrow. But I know Pigeon Tony's Last Stand is available tomorrow. So I wanted to mention that because they sent me the cookies today. And it doesn't get better to have somebody sending you cookies. Now, we're segueing. We we have we I wanted to highlight for a moment. We talked last week about independent bookstores and and bookstores and how important they are because reading is important and reading reading matters. When Loyalty came out in Galley, which is what it's called pre-publication. You see it's like a paperback. It gets sent around. And my beloved publisher Putnam sent it to really the most influential bookstores and said if you like it, let us know what you think. And we got a wonderful quote. I think if you remember, I read Browse About Books last week from Rehoboth and before that book passage in San Francisco. Today, I'm reading from Spokane, Washington, Auntie's Bookstore, which is a really, really famous independent bookstore in Spokane. And have very, very happily, Linda Bond, who is a, a bookseller there, really loved loyalty. And may I read you what she said? You know, I, I'm going to assume you answered yes. A resounding yes. Oh, Lisa, please read us praise from your book. Oh, I will. Linda Bond said, beautifully wit written with a warm narrative, its depth and meticulous scenic descriptions remind me of a couple of my favorite classics. This book's got everything. Wow. That's Linda Bond of Auntie's Bookstore on loyalty. I'm very, very honored to get that quote. So thank you so much, Linda. Please, please, as I said last week, support your bookstores, support books wherever they are sold. We need books in our communities, and that's so important. But thank you very, very much. I appreciate you being here, and I will see you next Monday night for more tomfoolery, literariness, carbohydrates, and go Eagles. Thank you very, very much, everybody. I love you guys and really appreciate you.